Hey everybody, uh, welcome again to another video. Today I'll be discussing neutropenic fevers. Uh, the reason for uh, this topic is because typically we see a lot of uh, patients who are getting chemotherapy in the wards and then are coming in with fevers uh, for many different causes. Um, in, the, in the end, they might end up in the ICU as well. Um, so it'll be important to discuss this topic. Uh, we'll be going over really the definitions of neutropenia and its categories. Um, which it, um, microbes you would want to consider uh, covering for these patients. Uh, and then eventually we'll discuss risk calculators and as well as really knowing what the IDSA or I, um, the infectious disease um, guidelines are for patients with neutropenic fevers as well as those who might be receiving either um, prophylaxis for, um, for neutropenia. Uh, so with that being said, I also want to give a small disclaimer, like any other video that I that I do. Uh, all the information that I give is purely my own um, my own thoughts about the subject. It doesn't mean uh, that you guys should follow anything I say without knowing yourself um, the information that I give give you. So make sure you guys read up before you implement anything that I say um, in the clinical setting. Um, so neutropenia is. A broad topic, um, and it varies obviously from severity. Uh, but neutropenia, you could think of just patients like patients when patients have leukocytosis, they have elevated white blood count. Neutropenia is just an absolute neutrophil count that's less than a normal. Um, there's different ways of defining neutropenia. Patients could come in with mild neutropenia, and knowing the numbers could help you understand kind of the severity of it. Uh, but patients with an ANC or absolute neutrophil count of less than 1500, that's when patients have mild. Uh, mild is categorized from 1,000 to 1,500. Uh, moderate neutropenia is um, 500 to 1,000, and then severe would be less than 500. Um, and kind of the you know obviously with any other patients, the reason why we want to we want to look at these patients is because a lot of these patients who are getting chemotherapy, there's different causes of neutropenia. You could have malignant neutropenia, non-malignant neutropenia. Malignant neutropenia is obviously patients who have chemotherapy, um, and that's why they have neutropenia. Or patients who potentially might have um, hematologic uh, malignancies, and that's like patients with uh, bone marrow uh, aplasias or just any other malignancies of the bone marrow, and that's why they also have a higher risk for neutropenia. Um, so just something that not just because not because not all patients with malignancy have neutropenia. Some patients. Uh, without malignancies could also have neutropenia. So patients with uh, non-malignant neutropenia from an infection, that's actually part of the septic criteria is leukopenia as well. Uh, patients who also have our, could get drug-induced neutrop neutropenia, and a lot of the drugs are, um, the reason for the leuk neutropenia from the drugs is because some agents could cause a pleasure of the bone marrow. Um, so, but they might, they have um, risk calculators as in general, to be able to stratify kind of what the patients are at risk for uh, in terms of complications. So there's a couple calculators that we look at. Uh, there's a multinational association for supportive care in cancer. That's a mass score. There's also a CISNA score, which is a clinical index for uh, stable febrile neutropenia. And it kind of looks at patients who are at high risk for getting very severe complications. Um, and with these scoring systems, even though they are not perfect, it kind of guides clinical decision making regarding the condition, whether the patient should be admitted um, in patient care versus outpatient, whether they should get oral or IV antibiotics. Um, and so that's kind of like a more of a, not a hundred, most people don't use these calculators, but in general, they're out there to be able to kind of help us guide management um, and understand kind of the burden of disease. Um, and I'm going to link them here so you guys can have a better understanding of them. But in general, the ones that I feel more clinical index of stable febrile neutropenia is one that's useful. Um, and it looks at kind of the ECOG performance, which is kind of how well the patients are doing in terms of their activities. Um, it looks at any cardiovascular disease, any monocytes. Really, you should look at it and kind of figure out um, each patient's profile based on that. Um, and so, but um, that's just more of a guide. You, obviously, you won't decide your whole management on just based on the calculator. It's all taking the clinical context of the patient in mind. Um, so in terms of um, kind of pathogenesis, um, obviously, patients could have, uh, like I said, kind of these these disorders or this neutropenia from chemotherapy-induced um, 
And a lot of it could be just kind of immunosuppressive effects of the chemotherapy, uh, putting patients higher risk for infection. Um, and there was kind of significant studies looking at kind of just the increased um, phagocytic activity of neutrophils. Most patients, might, uh, when they have neutropenia, when they're getting chemotherapy, their counts are low. So the first sign of infection will be uh, fevers, actually. That's when neutropenic fever is um, more of a uh, red alarm for patients to, to suggest that they are in sep sepsis. Um, and so in terms of the bacterial pathogens, you obviously want to consider bacterial uh, as well as fungal pathogens, uh, some viral pathogens as well that patients are at risk for with neutropenia. Um, in terms of bacterial pathogens, really the big thing you want to look at is uh, pseudomonas, pseudomonas um, gram-negative bacilli. They're most, the most commonly identified pathogens in these patients. Um, and so guidelines actually are pretty strict about covering patients with, pseudo, with pseudomonal coverage. And of course, you want to look at staph, epi, staph, aria, strep, um, all the other common gram-positive organisms. Um, and the fungal infections are also patients who are high risk with neutropenic fevers. Um, and Patients with kind of high risk features for serious complications, you definitely want to consider fungal covering them for possible fungal infections. And those are patients with a, I'll give you guys a kind of table here. Uh, but typically at this point, ID is should be kind of suggesting fungal coverage for these patients. Um, and it's not something that um, in the wards you would have to know all this criteria, but it's more about clinical judgment. Obviously, if the patient's persistently febrile, after a couple of days of being in antibiotics, um, we haven't really identified the source. And at that point, you will not be wrong in covering them for fun fungemia, um, just because there's a very high risk for patients with neutropenia. Really, anything with immunosuppression could cause patients to have fungemia. So it's a, it's, you're making, it's not a bad call to cover them for um, fung fungal infections. Um, and then the ones that are, you want to look for are, um, you know, candida, aspergillosis, um, fungal infections. Um, and then candida albicans. But really the whole idea is of with antibiotics and starting empiric treatment. Empiric really is um, one of the most important things you can do is empiric means that before you even could um, localize the source of infection, you want to cover patients broadly because you have a high pretest probability that patients most likely have these type of infections. Um, so guidelines, uh, we'll go over them in a bit. Uh, but I'll, I'll let you know which antibiotics, uh, at least in my experience, I like to put patients on with uh, neutropenic fevers. And, I like, and I'm going to discuss kind of the uh, guidelines and see if they agree with uh, our management. And then obviously viral pathogens, you have herpes simplex um, 1 and 2 um, that you want to cover. Um, but typically uh, for those patients, you, you would have muc mucositis or just really un other other uh, more presenting symptoms to suggest a viral etiology. Um, obviously, less commonly, you could have Epstein-Barr, CMV, HSV. So those are the ones you want to look consider if patients are clinically not getting better, even both on a fung um, uh, fungal as well as bacterial coverage. Um, so the timing of antibiotics is very important. Like I said earlier, the better. Uh, these patients are obviously sick. They're at septic shock, and their you know, suppression is very decreased, so they're not able to mount a, a response. Um, so you need to help them out with antibiotics. Um, so the other thing that I'll discuss now is kind of really the, the there's an article, IDSA Clinical Practice Guidelines Update. Uh, that was published in 2018. And really what this was is just kind of looking at uh, what are the up, more updated guidelines for patients with neutropenia um, and looking at the guidelines for prophylaxis with patients with cancer-related immunosuppression. Um, in general, they said, um, um, so there's a couple of things that we will discuss. Yeah, so um, so in, in, in the, one of the guidelines that we want to consider is um, in, in patients that are coming in with neutropenic fever, what empiric antibiotics is appropriate and in, in, um, in which manner. Uh, so they said that patients who are being hospitalized, um, they said that immunotherapy with an anti-pseudomonal agent such as cefepime, uh, icarapenam, like meropenam, amapenam, or a Sosin is recommended. And then you could also add other uh, micro antimicrobials um, depending on kind of the complications and really the source of infection uh, for, for patients with neutropenia, neutropenic fevers. So typically what I do is obviously I consider what the source of infection is for patients. Um, if the patients are having like abdominal issues, um, cefepime uh, is not actually, is not a good drug because it doesn't cover for anaerobes. 
um, so typically I just put patients on SOSIN. So kind of looking at more of a cool picture and figuring out, you know, what am I covering and why and what sort of infection do I think this patient is having. Um, but they, something that was really kind of also interesting is that vancomycin is not recommended as a standard part of um, the initial antibiotic regimen. Um, so patients should not just be on SOSIN, obviously, or, and VANC and SOSIN, or VANC and some other um, pseudomonal coverage. VANC is only useful if patients have a high clinical suspicion for uh, catheter-related infection, for MRSA, they have a prior infection of MRSA, and the reason why they're coming in is because maybe they have a recurrence for like a, so a soft or, or skin soft tissue infection or pneumonia with um, MRSA. So that's kind of interesting, and uh, and then the other kind of more general picture was talking discussing more for prophylaxis. Um, so once patients um, and kind of understanding, really the big thing is understanding that all patients with neutropenic fevers are not the same. Um, patients will have a soft, um, like essentially an organ malignancy um, versus a hematologic, hematologic malignancies uh, have different risks. Um, and guidelines are actually reflect reflect that. So a lot of the patients who have hematologic malignancies and neutropenia, they receive a lot of uh, prophylaxis for bacterial um, coverage. Um, so patients f who have febrile neutropenia, um, they are they should actually be on um, typically a fluoroquinolone. It's kind of uh, for prophylaxis um, because they have a high risk for um, for neutropenia, febrile neutropenia. Um, and also patients who have um, more of a high-risk features, meaning based on their chemotherapy or their cancer, they most likely will be in the neutro neutropenic for the greater than seven days, um, which typically for those patients are patients with hematologic um, malignancies. Um, so those patients actually do uh, get a fluoroquinolone prophylaxis um, because they have more of a high-risk features. And that's reflective of the IDSA guidelines that I'll kind of link here. Um, so the other thing also is same in this, under the same kind of thought process. Patients also like um, hematologic disorders, like patients with AML, myelodysplastic syndrome, or who have received um, a hematopoietic stem, stem cell transplants. Those patients also get antifungal prophylaxis, um, and so that's um, and a lot of times patients who have like just soft tissue uh, malignancies do, do not get any of this prophylaxis just because there's a lower risk for them to have these complications. And then in terms of bacterial complications, um, usually these, for these patients are patients who are at risk for getting PCP. Typically patients who are getting prednisone greater than 20 milligrams so above, above the superphys or the physiologic range. Um, and then th they're getting that dose for more than one month. And those patients should be getting prophylaxis for um, bacterium, for PCP. Uh, for HSV, um, they said they um, just kind of Patients who are undergoing the stem cell or, le or leukemia induction therapy do should receive a cyclovir, um, not not any other patient. Um, and then obviously they say that patients who are neutropenic should it's okay for them to get the influenza, but it should be uh, inactivated. Obviously, uh, so those are kind of the basic guidelines, and that's something that I kind of always kind of was wondering is who actually get, is in prophylaxis, and for this is most seems. You know, at least in my impression that a lot of the patients who have hematologic disorders receive these um, these prophylaxis um, uh, and patients who have actually have prolonged neutropenia also as well. So you could have prolonged neutropenia in the setting of uh, soft tissue malignancies and these patients would be good candidates for prophylaxis. Um, but typically for those patients who have high risk features are typically hematologic malignancies and that's why they receive these prophylaxis. In the end, all the, the decision to put them on prophylaxis or not would be done by um, in the, under the discretion of the hematologic oncology unit or service, um, and it won't be your decision to put them on because you won't be following them, at least the, uh, if you're a, just a regular internal medicine resident. All right, so I hope this helped. Um, uh, neutropenic fever is actually a very important topic. It's good for us to re understand kind of which antibiotics to put them on, uh, what, which ones cover which um, bugs. Um, so I'll be making another video discussing kind of antibiotic coverage and just kind of uh, making sure that um, we understand kind of what the new updates are in terms of different uh, trials that have been done um, and knowing which antibiotics cover for which bugs. All right, well, I hope this helped. Um, I hope um, you guys understand neutropenic fever a little bit better now. 
Um, before I leave, like I said, I want to give you another reminder that all this information is just my own way of thinking through this. Um, doesn't mean that you guys should take everything I say as uh, true statements. Obviously, read everything on your own uh, and do not believe um, anything I say until you read every journal or every article that I mentioned here. Until And, and with that being said, uh, consult with your attending and your uh, seniors before uh, following any of, the, any of this advice and applying this to uh, patients in the wards or in the ICU. Thank you guys. Have a great day.